Late last week, Andrea Mangucci released his hot take or his opinions about the Fury and Beans banning, and there's a lot to take apart here. There's a lot of his opinions that I think a lot of the modern player base just generally don't agree with. I think there's a lot of nuance to it, and I think there's a lot to break down that's important for old and new coming modern players alike. And I wanna do that just today. I wanna to provide three big points that I think we can take away from this, or at least counterpoints to his discussion. But before we get into that, I wanna just let y'all know if you wanna see more videos like this, obviously subscribe to the channel, like the video, and let me know what you wanna see more of in terms of discussions like this in the comment section down below. And I also wanna provide you with some caveats. So before we get into those three big points with the timestamps down below, the caveats are really going to be that First and foremost, where this opinion comes from. I want to point out that this is not an attack against Andrea at all as a person. This is simply breaking down and reacting to the argument itself. So if I get heated, if I get opinionated, it is about the argument itself. It's not anything against Andrea whatsoever. Second of all, you have to understand where both players' opinions are coming from, mine and Andrea's. There are two types of Magic the Gathering creators or people in the space at large. There are content creators and there are pro players people that in general uh two types of people that in general contribute to the content of the game pro players are folks that focus on winning and optimizing and playing the game in a successful winning fashion as i just mentioned so whether that be through cedh or just playing constructed play in standard modern legacy whatever going to tournaments and grinding these are the type of folks that want to put up results have a lot of games per day in an average format with certain decks. They have a certain type of opinion, and I think their goals are aligned with winning, their goals are al aligned with optimizing, and they very much have a very focused view on a certain format or two. Some of them spread themselves out, maybe they have a wide variety of focuses and they're not able to hone in on a problem because they don't focus in on a certain format for too long. Whereas the other type of player is someone like me, a content creator, someone whose goal and focus isn't necessarily about winning, but whether spreading awareness about a certain brand, a certain archetype, or a certain way of life in the game, their goal is going to be more focused in on that specifically, whether it's bringing light to commander, whether it's bringing light to the mill archetype, their opinions are going to be different as well. So from the perspective of a content creator, I'm critiquing someone who is largely in that perspective, a pro player, someone who has had that competitive grind and is going to be providing their perspective of the beans and fury banning from someone who grinds formats, maybe not plays casually in that sense. So from those two perspectives, let's talk about the actual statement itself. Let's read through it. Andrea's statement was, I think this is currently the most unbalanced modern since Modern Horizons 2. The banning of Fury and Beans made Yawgmoth and Amulet too strong with only Rhinos thriving as a deck that's good against both. The metagame was balanced before with Scam as the perceived best deck, which is insane, saying perceived. Lots of decks tied at the top and no clear winner on win rate. I beg Wizards to stop listening to complaints online and start focusing on only the win rate of decks at major events and using a higher bar to ban expensive cards, i.e. Fury, and decks, i.e. Four Color Beans. Please don't just ask for even more cards to be banned and wish for even more people to lose money. Oh, so this is about money now. Just because you can't win with your specific deck. Not every single deck can be a winning one in every competitive format. Completely fair. Even if we want as many possible to be uh, as many as possible to be strong, the only reason cards should be banned is if their win rate is too high, and bans like these can easily make things worse as they have now. I love modern; it's a very skill-intensive format and a rewarding format, and I want to keep it as balanced above all else. Oh, baby. There is a lot to break down here, but I'm going to try and break it down into three specific points that I think are very valuable to focus on. Ooh, let's get right into it. First of all, the metagame. From a metagame perspective, what is this discussion about? And I think this tweet sums it up. I really hope this is sarcasm, but I'm going to take it as not. Someone asked, I agree they're too ban happy, but focus, which is what? What do you mean they're too ban happy? Unban Splinter Twin. But focusing on a win rate is a bad idea. Look at Inverter and Pioneer. Completely non-oppressive win rate, but it made a format so unfun and nearly killed it. Completely true. Hard co uh, card cost, I think, should never be a factor if ban worthy, ban or not. So they didn't mention card cost. Exactly right. People losing money in this game is not a legitimate argument for banning 
any card in a card game. Let's get that out of the way right now. Investing and your price in this game does not trump the accessibility and the play factor for other folks in this game. I do not care and you should not care if someone loses thousands of dollars in the deck that they have invested into if the deck gets banned. Other decks in that format should similarly be priced at $1,000. Accessibility and availability is a whole other argument. In an environment where you are playing competitive decks and assuming all decks are equal, if one deck gets banned and you lose money on it, that should not be a, uh, a factor in that deck getting banned at all. It is just about win rates, it's just about play experience, and it's just about those two things at a whole. Now, Andreas says, Inverter Unfun, it was probably the peak of Pioneer, and the format never really recovered. Okay, so, um, as someone who doesn't play Pioneer, I will say that first and foremost. Pioneer has a lot of folks around it that love the metagame, love the play of the format, the back and forth of it. They really do like what Pioneer has to offer. I personally don't, and that's okay. But I played during the Inverter era. I did that. I have videos on this channel about how perceived fun it was, right? Inverter almost destroyed this format. And people will say, oh, it's because of the pandemic. No one was really playing Magic at the time because Pioneer didn't have large scale support at the time. That's one fair argument, completely fair. And I will have to acknowledge that as a withstanding factor. But they allowed Inverter to go on too long. Inverter's representation in the format was too high. It was not favorable to play other decks at all in that metagame. Inverter literally almost destroyed a premier format that is now finally coming onto Arena. And this take is garbage. Inverter Unfun, it was the peak of the Pioneer format. That is garbage. That is awful. That's a terrible take, okay? Inverter destroyed this format similar to how Scam was destroying Modern. It represented approximately 30% of the metagame at times. 25 plus percent of the metagame in Modern was Scam. The play rate was insane. Win rate did not matter at the time because it has to be about representation of the deck and play rate, the metagame was completely taken over by Scam. Yes, there were archetypes that were coming to the top, like Hardened Scales, like Tron, that had good matchups against these decks and they were able to thrive. Completely fair, I will also acknowledge that. But it doesn't mean that the deck didn't deserve something to be removed out of it. Whether or not the correct ban was Fury or Grief, that's not what I'm here to argue. Not in this point, at least. This is a terrible take, you need to consider the representation of decks in a metagame and and scam was way too high. And this is a representation of why I think Andrea's pro player mentality is ruining his take on this. I think the take is wrong from this perspective as point number one. Next point, we have to look at the numbers. From a numbers perspective, which is kind of what I was alluding to as well in my previous point, let's take a look at this one right here. So Pleasant Kenobi starts this conversation off by, isn't scam still a sizable part of the metagame right now? It is. Do we have stat sources that say otherwise? I'm sure if Yogmoth is too good now, is the reason that enough that Beans or Fury, or Grief and Sad, didn't deserve the ban hammer. So MG Guile, um, they say that I disagree with the balance claims. Modern before um, and after the ban. So let's look at this. Rakdos Evoke. 25% of the archetype breakdown of the competitive events. And I really like this argument here because Andrea talks about take, you need to take advantage and numbers from competitive events at large. That is exactly what's happening here. Four seasons and, and then December 2nd, 2023, up to then 25% of the metagame of those tournament archetypes. And then after that, a much higher spread. Cascade, Tron, Yogmoth. Is it Merkta? Yogmoth isn't even at the top of the metagame. Right? It's not being played by everyone. Now, whether or not it's converting is a different question, and I understand that that's not what's being represented by this chart, and I will acknowledge that. But the spread is much higher. You have a lot more folks trying a large amount of different things, and these decks will be converting at different numbers to high percentages. Maybe there's a low representative uh, representation of hardened scales, but they're converting to top eights a lot more. Again, that's not what this deck is. Uh, this chart is about. These win rate charts are going to be a lot more representative of that. But again, really, what I want to show here is the numbers. Going to my previous point about representation is what is key, and that's going to kind of lead into my final point where representation of what people play against is widely almost if if it's not equally important to win rates 
might slightly be more important than the win rate of a certain deck. Scam may be at a 50% win rate. It might be at a slightly weaker uh, win rate, but you have to understand that ultimately speaking about scam, that deck still has the most oppressive. And let me know in the comment section down below if you don't believe this. If you don't believe this next take that I have, I really want to hear your thoughts in the comment section down below because that is, I want to hear your counter argument because that's insane. Scam still has and did have the most oppressive top end in the modern metagame. And when I say top end, I mean what they could do at their peak. The turn one double Thoughtseize with a 4-3 Menace left behind is absolutely insane. It, it's insane value. It's crazy. It's astronomical. You take out an opponent's best two cards, the removal, their, their early game plan, and you say go with a 4-3 that is unblockable. It is essentially an unblockable 4-3. Absolutely insane value in terms of what it does. And then if you have further protection spells, you can protect it with that too. Well, some of the best graveyard hate removal main boarded in Douthy Voidwalker, the single best red drop ever made in Magic the Gathering's history in Ragavan in the deck as well. Scam was insane in terms of what the deck could do that no other deck can do ever. No other deck could do that is currently unbanned. But let's go to my third point. The third point that I want to highlight is the people itself. The people that play this game and their representation of what they play against matters as well. It is about the numbers, it is about the win rate, but it is also about the player experience. So let's take a look at some casual experiences here, where Dennis says, I really don't think that an affected card deck price should be a factor when determining bans for a competitive format. The target metric should be competitive balance and keeping gameplay loop within a reasonable expectation, such as mental misstep bans. Mental misstep is kind of an extreme of all of that. And by no means I said it was, but it should only be about win rate. You literally said people shouldn't be losing money, but okay, uh, whatever, I, uh, I'll let you backtrack, okay? What I wanna highlight here is yes, it isn't about the money, but I wanna use a simple example to extrapolate, and please let me know if you don't think this example is apt at all. Let's say, for example, you have the, you have Wizards of the Coast catering to two different environments. You have the pro player, the singular pro player that spends $100, and then you have 100 casual players that spend $1. Okay, what is more valuable for Wizards to cater to? It is 100% by all means necessary. It is more valuable to cater to 100 casuals spending a $1 because their potential to spend more money is then example is an astronomical from there. They have a good play experience with $1. They will spend more money. They will spend another dollar. They will spend $10. They might even evolve into that person being $100. But that invested pro player that is spending $100, they may continue to spend that amount or they may spend none because they found a rental service. They found the deck they have and they will just grind that out. Their ceiling is reached. So similarly to a player's experience, the casual player's experience, the average magic player's experience, the one that does not grind, that plays a league a week, that goes to FNM, that does all these things. When they go to these events and all they see is scam, do not lie to me. When you go to a spiky LGS of in a major city, for example, in Toronto, face-to-face -to -face games, there were a fair amount of scam players. There was a good amount of diversity, and I will give it that. There's a lot of big spikers out here too, a lot of great players that did not want to play scam as well. But scam was there, especially if we went to the tournaments. A lot of folks played scam. And these decks have a lot of representation. When you have these bad play experiences, they become, they, they, they combine, they stack on top of each other, making players not want to spend that money. Those 100 people spending a dollar now becomes 80 people spending a dollar. More and more scam stays, 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 and then continues to be 60 people spending a dollar. Whereas that $100 player, that pro player, still almost at his ceiling will stay there and be like, oh, it's fine, I'm playing scam. It's okay, I'm playing this deck that beats scam. I'm strong, like, oh, it's fine, it's okay. The average player does not have the resources or time Time to switch these decks to play different strategies and therefore their play experience but all must also be equally protected if not also the pro players their experience matters too. the casual experience for wizards of the coast is honestly way more important especially as we've seen from commander being pushed so much if the casual player is being oppressed by scam 
if they are playing scam or they are being oppressed by scam in a large metagame representation, then win rate has to be trumped by play experience. Scam was all over the leagues. It had one of the worst play patterns in modern's history. Truly in modern's history. It still has one of the worst play experiences in modern's history. And if you don't think that you're crazy, let me know in the comment section down below again. If you do not think that modern scam has one of the worst play patterns at the top end, you're crazy. And I need to hear why you think that. But these are ultimately the three points that I think why Andreas take is wrong. I think him as a pro player, his pro player opinion is being is clouding this judgment that you have the ability and the resources to swap around, be the casual player, be the pro player, play different formats effectively, come back from different perspectives. That's fine. But the average player does not have that. And when you let the experience of the average player drown because of numbers, because of their play experience, and ultimately because of the metagame itself, then you ultimately happen what happened to you. You have happened what happened to Pioneer where it almost died as a format because for some reason, you know what? The inverter deck had a sub 50% win rate. So why do we ban it? That doesn't matter. Inverter was everywhere. It was an oppressive deck that you could not beat legitimately with your own casual deck. You have to play a specific few strategies and that's not a healthy metagame. That's ultimately where I stand. That's ultimately where I stand with Andreas take here. Again, this is nothing against him as a person. This is about this take. I think this take is awful. I think some of the supporting arguments about this take are absolutely dog tier awful. But I will also acknowledge that me as a content creator, me as a mill player, have my own biases. I have my own experiences in modern that have led me to this. So I need to hear your comments down below. Let me know what you think about my three points, my caveats, and, and the discussion generally in this video that I've tried to bring forward. Do you think I'm wrong? Do you agree with Andrea? Do you agree with some of my takes? Do you just think that I didn't bring across some of these points or I missed something very crucial? I want to hear that all in the comment section down below because ultimately modern is my favorite format. I want to see this format thrive. And I know we're about to go through a big rotation of the format right now with Modern Horizons 3. And I really hope that we are focusing from a player based perspective and from a design perspective that we are focusing on the right things when it comes to a healthy metagame, when it comes to a good player experience in the format, and we're not catering to the wrong crowd and the wrong opinions.